research is a little bit off. <laughs> they need to go a little bit deeper and, and analyze things better. Six-year-old, keep that in mind. My parents were overjoyed. Unfortunately, Canada is a, is a very judgmental society when you dig down. Everything is about how you appear and meeting up to the appearances. Very friendly people, but we don't like being judged. And consequently, a lot of Canadians judge others. So, obviously very proud that they had what, in no other words, devices, a genius son. They were especially ecstatic for all of the wonderful things that I would want to accomplish. And they had many dreams for me, particularly my father. Then school happened. And it was my father who realized first that something was amiss. My teachers just said I was badly behaved, and my parents need to, need to do something about that. They need to teach me better manners, they needed to practice stuff at home so that I could fit into the classroom environment. So it was quite disruptive. Nobody likes the kid that always talks, and especially no teacher likes the kid that argues them down. <laughs> Particularly not one that wins the arguments. <laughs> After a lot of pushing, my father was able to convince the school that something else was going on. So they finally agreed to refer Jay to a specialist. So I went and saw a specialist, and they administered a pediatric early education examination to determine my capacity to learn. The results were delivered to my parents and myself. Mr. and Mrs. Edgecombe were very sorry. Your son has an intellectual disability. He will face certain challenges. There will be struggles in his life that he will never escape. The best thing you can hope for is that he might manage to live somewhat independently with you later in life. My parents obviously were shattered. They were also very confused. <laughs> I'm going to skip forward in the story now because my TEDx talk and the Attitude TV episode cover most of this period, and they do it extremely well. We're going to jump to six months ago. So I have been running my business for about a year and a half, doing very well for those of you who have stalked me and found out about my story and what I have achieved. And in order to take myself to the next level, I attended a three-day leadership retreat called Evolve by Choice, run by a woman named Sally Anderson. I don't know if anyone in the room knows her. Anybody heard of Sally Anderson? Brilliant. Long range high five. <laughs> when I walked into that three day retreat, I did so not really knowing what to expect, but we determined that I had an affirmative statement. Anybody know what an affirmative statement is? Yep, what is, what is an affirmative statement, Matt? An affirmative statement is what's your kind of vision statement or your, your, your positive statement, right? That's yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, so it's a declaration of who you are, is, is how Sally explained it, but that, that one's really good as well. There's lots of different meanings behind affirmative statement. But I had a declaration that was at the core of my being. Not as an autistic person, not as a male, not as a father, as a human being. Anybody want to guess what it was? To make a difference? Interesting, love that. Any, any other guesses? Come on, think of me. I'm the guy that did a TEDx talk in front of a thousand people. I am huh? to be heard. Love well, that one. It's not it. You won't guess it. Any ideas? Leadership. Sorry? Leadership. Leadership. Ooh, I love you. Nope. I walked into the Evolve by Choice three day leadership retreat to achieve unrecognizable transformation. With the affirmative statement, I deserve to die. I deserve to die. Pretty dark, eh? The sad thing is, Sally will explain, is that most people have something relatively similar. Unfortunately. You've got to dig deep, deep, deep to find it. But it is there. It is... Is it any wonder that I struggle to receive praise? It is, is it any miracle that I felt so insecure running my business and refused to acknowledge what I was achieving or take the necessary steps to grow it? 
The sad thing is, ladies and gentlemen, that particularly among our youth, my affirmative statement is not that unusual. As a result of a process, which I am not at liberty to divulge, due to privacy reasons, and deep emotional trauma, I created a new affirmative statement. So walking into that retreat, was I deserve to die. Walking out of that retreat, my affirmative statement was, I am a mighty warrior here to shine light into darkness. And I walked out of that retreat with two other things. The first was a realization of my life's purpose, which we will get into in a minute. And the other thing was a realization. One of the things that Sally said to me on the retreat when my diagnosis came up, my first one, the ADD one, when all of my problems began, was, Jason, you need to recognize something. You need to recognize that that diagnosis was the greatest moment of your life. And I went, the fuck? <laughs> what are... <sighs> How can you say that? How can you tell me that all the suffering, the bullying, the pain, the loss, the broken relationships, the, the way I think about my parents and everything that has come from that single moment, is a good thing. You don't piss me off even more. She was right. <laughs> because when I was diagnosed in 1994 or 5, it was the beginning of my life's friendship. So from that moment, I was the odd one, the outcast. I didn't fit. I was always weird. I was always the last one to get picked for teams. Being generous is something I was picked at all. Cast aside, I was bullied by teachers. I was bullied by specialists. Unfortunately, I was bullied by my own parents. Don't think bad of them. There's reasons for that. But all from that moment, I was taught what it feels like to lack acceptance. To lack a love of self and a recognition of my deserving to be alive in the world. So from this realization, because she was right, she was annoyingly right like that, I have come to see my path in an entirely new life. As a result of that diagnosis, I was trained down to being basically useless. Yeah, basically useless. Couldn't boil an egg or cook toast. I still struggle with butter toast. Anybody else have that problem? <laughs> yeah, it's weird. What is it with butter? It just doesn't spread. <laughs> Recognizing your own greatness is hard, especially because we live in a world that tries to tell you that you aren't great. And particularly, unfortunately, we have an education system which doesn't help with that either. Now, I talk a lot about education, and I want to be really, really extra super clear on something. I am not attacking teachers. I am not attacking specialists. I am not attacking TAs. I am not attacking anybody that works in and around the education system. Because you see, teaching is one of our highest callings as a society. It's taking upon yourself the responsibility of educating our young people and ensuring that our future is a bright and beautiful one. The problem with education is not the people, it's the system. Anybody know where our education system comes from? designed in the Industrial Revolution in Britain to ensure that there was a able and educated enough workforce to provide labor for mills, fields, mines, all that sort of stuff. Anybody know who it was designed by? Man? Yep, what type of man? The military? Very close, and you are correct, but a specific part of the military. It was designed by the wealthy land-owning elite of 
British society in the Victorian. Anybody here? This is buff. Brilliant. So you will know that Victorian era Britain was one of the most uh, prejudiced and intolerant societies that mankind has ever created. <laughs> and they designed our education system, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so all of the wonderful, hardworking people like Sue have to fight uphill to do things which are quite frankly natural. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But our education system breeds a certain type of person, and so it creates an individual who has built their own cage. Two years ago, I started my own business. In fact, two years ago today, I started my own business. I got off the stage at TEDx and collapsed on the ground and breathed heavily for a while. <laughs> I get very stressed when I'm talking. And, you know, I, I talked to people. And people came and talked to me and they're like, wow, you're amazing. I can't believe you're on the spectrum. Obviously, nobody on the spectrum said that. <laughs> It's just a thing, don't get offended, it's okay. And, and people on the spectrum come up to me like, oh man, you're so amazing, you're so inspiring, you know, it was really great to, to see you and hear about your journey. And I said, thank you, what's yours? And I had this idea of collecting stories together and publishing a book of all of the success stories of people on the spectrum who had broken this mold. Didn't happen, might still. Two weeks afterwards, however, I received an email from the head organizer. And he said, hey, I have a friend, she has a son, he's, you know, got his diagnosis, he's having a really hard time in school. Oh, yeah. Do you think you could meet up with her and spend an hour and give her a few points? You know, provide a little bit of advice, what do you think might work for you? And, and this sort of deal, and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll be the center of attention again. <laughs> yeah. And get a free coffee out of it, even better. And I emailed the lady and I said to her, yo, hey, I'm Jason, blah, 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 blah. meet up. Arranged the meeting, sat back and went, shit. What am I supposed to tell this one? What am I supposed to impart in a one hour coffee meeting that is meaningful enough to change this young man's life for the better? I'm not going to think about it. I can now, but then I could. And so I thought to myself, Jason, when you were 14, when you were being bullied, when you were being asked to pick, a long-term career choice when deep down inside you didn't you deserve to have money or eat half the time. What did you need? What was going to help you? And I thought, well, I needed somebody who'd been there. I needed somebody who'd walk the path before me and could say, there's a rope up here, or watch out for this kind of stuff, or, or you know what? Forget NCEA. You want to be a musician. You don't need NCEA to be a musician. You need a sound that people like. You need to practice your instrument. Or, or whatever. And so I, I met with the mother and I said, look, I would really love to give you advice. Can't, not that great. Remember the I deserve to die thing running around. But I said to her, I would love to mentor your son. And, and I'll do it for free and for a couple months and we'll see how it goes. See if I can make a difference, see if, if we can make this work. Two weeks later, later, it's going great. I said, do you know anybody else who might benefit from this? I got three names. I ended up working with three people. First one another, and one other one. At the end of the first month working with the second person, the mother came to me and said, oh my God, you are amazing. Like, what you are doing with my son is fantastic. He's smiling, he's excited about something during the week. I can get him out of his room away from his computer? We have to pay you for this. And I well, no, hey, like we said three months, we wouldn't. She's no, 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 look, I have this fine care, I'll pay you. Yes. Okay, sure. And from there, it's blossomed. I have had help from Asperger's Connections, from parent to parent. I have had help from all sorts of individuals and organizations. I have had the pleasure of working with some really cool young people. And I called my business Breaking the Label. And at the time I had no idea why, it just sounded cool. But what I have realized, among other things, is that when you can't love yourself and are living within a shroud of darkness, basically, it's really hard to see. It's a miracle I can even walk, actually. 
when, or that I used to be able to walk when you think about it. And when that light begins to lift, you start to see and understand things that you never did before. My martial arts instructor used to use an analogy. He said, when you, you know, begin to understand, it's like your head popping up above the water. And up until the point you've been drowning and struggling for air, and you've got no energy to think or really understand what's going on. But as soon as you're up, you're breathing, you can calm down and go, okay, I really need to look for an island and some food. <laughs> also, how did I get here? Why am I in my martial arts clothes in the middle of the ocean? Like, this is rather concerning. I never saw who's going to do this. And so I was able to understand why my subconscious created the name Breaking the Litter. It's the same reason that I invented the term neurodiversity. This is a great story. I was sitting there trying to think of a new way to refer to young people, to, to people on the spectrum and, and those who thought differently. I thought, oh, this is great. Neurodiversity. It's fantastic. It's talking about the mind, the differences. It's, it's not derogatory or, or a disab disabled label at all. I better Google it just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I was zero creativity on that one. <laughs> Movement's been around for years. Very, very well established. Oh well, I can still use it, it's not very much. <laughs> the reason I call my business breaking the label is because every single human being creates a cage. We create it through our upbringing, we create it through our education, we create it through our interpretations of what is going on around us. It is a natural part of the human mind. There was somebody speaking the other day about the reptile brain. That's exactly what it does. The reptile brain is responsible for the survival of the self and nothing else. The reptile brain is, is the part of the body that will gladly eat another human being because it does not consider anything else at the point of survival. That's why when an autistic person or many other types of individuals, when they're in a meltdown scenario, can't think, can't listen, can't act independently of their own emotions because they are in the reptile brain and they are just acting in survival mode. I'm scared, somebody's trying to kill me, I'm either going to run away, beat the shit out of it, or freeze in place. Usually we get stuck and end up doing nothing or screaming our arms out and punching a hole in a wall, which I did at work once, which is not good. But we are not the only types of people that do that. And so, by describing what I do as breaking a label, what I am talking about is helping somebody understand that just because housewife is used as a derogatory term by feminists does not mean that housewife is bad. That looking at yourself as autistic when other people view it as a disability is not in itself an empowerment. The best, the two best analogies I have actually, one is computer related, one is comic related. Belt. Not with the housewives. So, I need to work on that. First thing with the computers is you don't take a Mac to a PC repair shop and listen to the technician telling you it's broken because it doesn't run Windows. Well, it's, a, it's a Macintosh computer, like clearly it doesn't run Windows, clearly it doesn't run Windows products. Like, where's the confusion here? And the other one is with superheroes. Who, who here has a favorite superhero? Really? Come on, Superman, Deadpool, you got somebody, you got it here. Nobody questions their weaknesses, do that. Nobody, nobody questions the fact that Superman, if he holds a piece of kryptonite, he's going to die. There's, there's, there's no, nobody even argues about it, right? There's no question that, well, obviously he can fly at the speed of light and, you know, jump into the atmosphere and, and laser vision and stuff. So clearly, it's okay that he will die if he holds rock. <laughs> but for some reason, we question an autistic's noise sensitivity, or a dyslexic person's inability to read, and somehow use that as a defining quality. We talk about how a woman who makes a decision to stay home, or even better, a man who makes a decision to stay home to raise their children, is somehow doing the wrong thing. As if that even exists, as if wrong and right are simple universal concepts. See, everybody has a label, whether we realize it or not. And 
autistic or disabled are the really popular ones. Someone says, well, I can't do that because I'm autistic. Or, we need to change the way we're doing this because they're autistic. And, yeah, I need to extend some understanding and acceptance. That would be super helpful. And definitely with different types of disabilities, like being in a wheelchair or being blind, you know, we cannot be an advanced, civilized society if we just go, well, Iron Man has a big flight of stairs, and we can't get there too bad. We, we kind of need to provide a ramp. It only makes sense because accessibility is a really important part of our society, particularly in the Western world, and particularly here in New Zealand. And we like to think that we are a tolerant, accepting society. The first part is horrible. I don't like tolerance. I don't agree with tolerance. I will tell you why. Because you tolerate the things that you wish you could change but can't. If you have something, you know, like, I think of a good example that's not gross. Uh, <laughs> if your house is painted the wrong color but you can't afford to paint, you deal with it, don't you? It's like, oh, I don't really like the color, but I'm going to have to say that I'm tolerating the color of my house. You should not tolerate another human being. Sorry, that's, there's, that's easily nice and black and white for everybody. There's my autistic brain coming out. You should not tolerate another human being. You should not sit there and go, you're different and I wish you were more like me, but I can't change you. That doesn't work in relationships, it doesn't work with children. Yet that underpins our society, and it's part of our language. And language is huge. Like the other day someone was saying how you shouldn't use I can't, but I cannot. Because it still opens up the possibility of it happening, just maybe not this second. That's why I talk about acceptance. Because when you accept something, you acknowledge its right to exist purely as it is. No need to change, no need to shift, no need to please you or pander to your sensitivities in order for its right to exist to be validated. We tolerate ISIS, but we should not tolerate Muslims. That's a fantastic and very controversial example. So what is my purpose in life? Why am I here? Well, I'm here because I impressed Catherine, quite frankly. <laughs> but my mission in life is to teach neurodiversity to the world. And some people in this room are going to get very upset about that. Because I'm going to redefine for you what neurodiversity means. I have been on a number of Facebook groups watching and listening. I have had people comment to me. I have observed articles and references and conversations talking about neurodiversity as if it is a unique label for people on the spectrum or people who think differently. I have observed conversations between people talking about savantism and its connection to Asperger's. My favorite one I ever saw was a woman who said, just because I'm Asperger's doesn't mean I'm a savant. I'm normal just like everybody else. Which is it? Do you lack savantism or are you normal? Because they are mutually exclusive. My definition of neurodiversity is this. Neurodiversity is the concept that every human being has a unique and powerful gift to bring forward to the benefit of all mankind. Neurodiversity, in my mind, is the concept that every human being as a unique and powerful gift to bring forward to the benefit of all mankind. Savantism is an acknowledgement of a gift. So if you say, I am Asperger's, but I don't have a savantism because I'm normal, it's an oxymoron. Out of supreme curiosity, who here in this room is human? I don't see some hands. <laughs> I'm a little curious, but hey, I can roll with that. I'm all about acceptance if you are not human. <laughs> I love you all still. <laughs> it's okay. There's not going to be any discrimination or prejudice. The reason I do not like labeling people or using a label to define someone is because it creates an us versus them scenario. In the 1950s, they changed the way they referred to black people in the United States. They said, we're not going to call them Negroes, we're going to call them African-American citizens. 
and everything will get better. And it didn't. And it didn't because conversations would go like, well, I'm an American citizen, and I don't want to associate with African American citizens. But they're American citizens, yeah, but they're African American. Even the language, even if you have someone who's perfectly tolerant and go, I love African American people. I have friends that are African American. My wife's African American. You are still using a term which differentiates them from your fellow citizens. <laughs> Not that very many people in here are American, or some of the coolest people in here are, so that's it. We're multiculturally represented, yeah. It's great. I'm Canadian, there's Americans in here, we have British people, Chinese people, Japanese people, it's great. I don't believe in division. I believe in differences. I believe in acknowledging that someone is unique, but you can acknowledge somebody as a unique human being without dividing them from yourself. That is why I tell people that I work with people. I had a woman call me up on Monday and said, my son, he really doesn't like being treated as different. I said, great, I don't work with different people. I work with human beings. Because deep down, we all function the same. We all have a heart. Our neurons all transfer along our nervous system. There's not a human being alive where there are not these fundamental shared aspects. Some of them might be different. Some of them might not work as well. You've seen my handwriting, that's a perfect, perfect example of that. But fundamentally, we are all human. The greatest thing I've ever heard in relationship to that is from Avatar The Last Airbender. Not the movie, the cartoon show. Just want to make that clear. And it was the funny, weird guru up on the mountaintop, and he said, the greatest illusion in life is the illusion of separation. We are all one people, yet we live as if divided. We do it with our countries. We do it with socio-economic means. We do it with skin color. And we do it with labels like neurotypical and atypical. Are there steps in the right direction? Hell yes! When Thomas Edison was kicked out of school at the age of six, they called him adult. Anybody know what that word means? It's depressing. The next word they used was retarded. We're not getting any better people. Next word, they jump along a few. Well, my dad's one was stupid. And then along from that, it was intellectually disabled, handicapped, and then special needs. The problem, of course, is that the meaning behind the word didn't change. When, a, or when many mainstream medical professionals 20 years ago said special needs, what they meant was adult. The meaning didn't change. It was someone who cannot fit into society because of disability. They're still using the same meaning behind the word, which is why my definition of neurodiversity is different. Because from the moment I speak to somebody, I'm not talking about labels, I'm not talking about disabilities, I'm not talking about, you know, maybe they can fit in. I'm talking to a human being who has within them a spark of life, a beauty, a gift that is theirs and theirs alone to share with the entire human race. There, there is no escaping this fact. If, if someone comes to me and says, I'm not really good at anything, I ask, are you human? It's just usually yes. <laughs> Had a cat talk to me once. It's like, are you human? Uh, no. <laughs> Oops. Usually the answer is yes. And the response to that is great. You're good at something. You have a reason for being here. Regardless of your faith, this stands true. You are here for a reason. Even if you only believe in evolution, guess what? Evolution is the strong survive. The most adaptable survive. So if you manage to survive through childbirth, guess what? Guess what? You are the most adaptable. And therefore, have some sort of genetic trait that is worth passing on into your children. I work with young people in a lot of different states. In a lot of different mindsets. In a lot of different positions in their lives. And what I do never changes. It doesn't matter who I'm working with. I acknowledge the human being. I accept them for who they are. And I teach them to love themselves. Breaking the label has one mission. 
and that is to shape people's perspectives away from viewing disabilities as a negative and recognizing that what they are is a word. And the funny thing about language is we make words mean whatever we want them to. So somebody can call me disabled, and I can make that mean in my own head, super freaking awesome! <laughs> and it doesn't matter what their definition is, because it's my definition that matters to me. And it is each of your definitions that matters to you, so regardless of your label, you are who you choose to be. And guess what? Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. I forgot the rest of the coat now. Hang on. This is great. This is awesome. I'm going to stand up here awkwardly for like three seconds. <laughs> deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Oh, come on, Jason. <coughs> that one hurts. Yeah, I think hurt. That's all. Look it up. It's a really, it's a really great program. Right anyway. My point is that we are all human beings, which means we all deserve to live here and be part of our communities and interact with each other on an equal level. And regardless of the labels we place on each other, the real cage is up here. And that's the one you have to break. Which is what I help people do. I run social groups. I play Dungeons and Dragons for kids for really to great. <laughs> I do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which can take any form. I run the Minecraft Club, which is very popular. <laughs> and I'm working with other organizations to help them see and understand the benefit of recognizing the glory in every human being. Because we get lost in looking at the negative. It's human nature, unfortunately. We, we do take negative as more important because it's the negative that we've got to fix, right? Oh, shit. I learned how to handwrite when I was six. My handwriting is no better. I don't need to fix my handwriting. My handwriting does not define who I am as a human being. My ability to speak and my ability to influence other people is what defines me. And I'm pretty good at it. I like to think I'm pretty good at it. If I can give you a final message, because I think I'm over time, Nobody is bothered to stop me. Is that. Eh, I'll try to remember, I didn't. <laughs> there was an activist in the early 19th, 19th, 20th century who was arrested for communism, basically. And at his trial, he began his opening statement with the following line Your Honor, long ago I recognized my kinship with all living things. I say now as I said then, as long as there is a lower class, I am in it. As long as there is a criminal element, I am of it. As long as there is a soul in prison, I am not free. If you can take one message away from this, it's that I'm awesome. <laughs> no, don't take that. I mean, that's good, but don't take that. If you can take one message, it is to look at your fellow human beings not by the label that is used by our collective consciousness to define them, but to see them, really see them as the human beings they truly are. And the next challenge is to do that for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my pleasure to speak to you today. If you liked what you heard, or even if you hated what you heard, Please come talk to me. I would love to have a conversation. I have plenty of business cards. And yes, the swords are real. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You are awesome.
And I'd love an encouragement for all of us to look for that spark in everybody. Here's a little something. Hope everyone liked the reading. I do. And I love that you, um, when we were working out how I was going to keep them to time, he said, oh, you know when I'm 15 and 30, 30 in, and then I said, then we'll do this for cut. And I said, that's not my throat. We leave the sword in the 